yeah let us get back to business we are on the last leg this is slog overs I keep saying so that is what there is a saying there is a difference between the hero and an ordinary person is that one who lasts long in the final phase is the one who is the real hero. So, we have to even for winning 2020 or one day match we have to play well in the slog overs. So, that is what we will attempt to do now. So, we are into heat exchangers. So, I guess most of you or most of us are very familiar and this is the pet word which we routinely use heat exchangers. Whether we really use them or not I do not know, but still I guess we all use this. Okay. So, as I said I will not derive anything on the plain paper. I am going to go reasonably fast because I am sure all of you have gone through LMTD, NTU epsilon, but let us focus on more on interpretations, explanation rather than examples. Okay. So, that is why I am not going to spend time on what are the types of heat exchangers, what are the heat exchanger applications, all that I am not going to spend time at all. So, let us get to heat exchangers, but one clarification now that one of the persons had asked me, I thought I thought I should emphasize I usually used to go heat exchangers. Heat exchanger is a device, what is the device which we are worried about? Here we are not in this heat exchangers or even in UG heat exchangers whatever we teach we are not worried about direct mixing. One fluid is not directly going to mix with the other fluid. Those are also called as heat exchangers fortunately or unfortunately, but we are not going to be worried about those heat exchangers. Here we when we say heat exchanger we mean here that they are going to be separated. They are there is no question of mixing mixing with the hot fluid and the cold fluid. Okay. So, that is what we take up as the heat exchanger. Now, this is this is the hot fluid and this is the cold fluid I have just taken tube in tube. So, there are three resistances we can easily see that okay, there is convective resistance on the inner side, convective resistance on the outer side and then the conductive resistance. So, now there are two approaches one is the LMTD F approach or the LMTD approach another one is the epsilon NTU approach. What is known in the LMTD approach? I know the inlet temperatures, outlet temperatures, mass flow rates. What is that I am supposed to do is this size my heat exchange. So, that is what I can do with LMTD approach. In epsilon NTU approach, I, know I have been given the heat exchanger, it is there off the shelf in the market. I have been given the catalog of the heat exchanger. I know my mass flow rates and the inlet temperatures. I need to predict what would be the outlet temperature. Now, my question is can I do with epsilon NTU approach, can I size my heat exchanger using epsilon NTU approach? Sorry reverse question I think. The question is can I predict the outlet temperature using LMTD approach? How many knows? Why? Why not? Because I am not going to go in a logical fashion, I am going to go in an high entropy way that is fine. Why? Because, because epsilon LMTD approach means what? Okay, we will take up this question after we take analysis of LMTD approach. Point is answer is LMTD approach also can be utilized to predict the temperature uh, sorry to size the for a given size to predict the temperature for a given size to predict the temperature LMTD approach can also be used. I have to just take the differential element we will come to that little later. Why I am saying this because we should be telling that to the student. It will be iterative, it cannot be in one in one shot I will not get I have to do it iteratively, but we need to emphasize this to students. They should not be under the impression that it is exclusively epsilon NTU approach only can be used to predict the outlet temperatures. We should not be giving that impression to them because textbooks do not tell all this it is for us to figure it out. Okay. There are various types of heat exchangers, one is counter flow heat exchanger, parallel flow heat exchanger, double pipe heat exchanger. I am just going to take tube in tube heat exchanger, because I am sure all of us have built a tube in tube heat exchanger in our labs. We have enough field, why do we go for tube in tube heat exchanger? What is the typical wattage up to which I can build a tube in tube heat exchanger? 
or which is what is used typically for single phase if I am asking. I am, I am not getting into two phase at this point of time, we are handling only single phase heat exchanger. Typically, typically I will not go above 6 to 10 kilowatts. It is not that this is a standard rule, why because the size of my tube into how do I build my tube into bit exchanger in lab? It cannot be one pass, right? It cannot be one pass. One pass means only one tube cannot be there. If I get the length, when I calculate the size of the heat exchanger, if the length turns out to be 20 meters, can I build a heat exchanger of 20 meters? How, how long will be 20 meters? 20 into 3, 60 feet, 60 by 10, 6 story building. Can I lay down 6 story building? It is not possible. What should I do? I will have to take bends and make multiple passes. It is there here, multiple passes. You have to take through multiple passes. You can go through lot of multiple passes. Of course, that will increase the pressure drop. Everything comes with a cost that will increase the pressure drop. In spite of that taking multiple passes, there is a limitation up to which you can, you can hold this tube in tube heat exchanger, then you will go for that is as I said in the handbooks or it is not that I, I said 6 to 10 kilowatt, it is just a gross number. It is not that we cannot build tube in tube heat exchanger, if I have more space, I will I can always go for tube in tube heat exchanger, but I can make my size of the heat exchanger smaller if I go for other configurations, maybe shell and tube heat exchanger. Okay? So, that is why we usually do not go for larger capacities tube in tube heat exchanger. This is the point we need to emphasize to the students. Okay. Now, parallel flow, counter flow all of us know this is T H, what is this temperature? T H I, this is T H O, T C I, T C O. Okay. So, here also same thing T H I, T H O, T C I, T C O. Okay. So, now this is about compact heat exchanger just to say that the area density that is the heat transfer area surface area upon heat exchanger volume. These are the typical values for various heat exchangers. For a car radiator this beta is around 1000, whenever this beta is above 700 it is called as we use the word compact heat exchangers routinely. So, compact heat exchanger whenever the value is above 700 it is typically called as compact heat exchanger. I have just put human lungs because that will give you anything human is going to be highly efficient, highly efficient because nature knows how to optimize things by itself. So, it has optimized and the human lung seat exchanger is having a beta of 20,000 quite highly dense. Okay. So, that is that is about the area density and of course, there are cross flow heat exchangers. Okay. So, they can be mixed, unmixed, one shell and two tube pass, two shell, four tube pass, okay, all configuration. Shell and tube means I think all of us know okay, in the present day in Google images, you can I that is what I do when I go to the class, Google images I take the pictures and go and show them the shell and tube heat exchangers. Of course, not for UG, but perhaps we can do that for UG also that that is what I used to do for heat exchangers course. These are plate fin heat exchangers, these are plate fin heat exchangers that is there are plates in between there are fins. Okay. So, that is essentially the heat transfer is taking place, the mode of the heat transfer is not only conduction, but also sorry not only convection, but also conduction because through those fins, through those fins. So, now locating those fins, roughening those fins all that is an issue, it is not out of the world. In today's world, I mean people are talking about single phase heat exchange, single phase nuclear reactors. What is that? High temperature gas reactor or nuclear reactor, I do not recollect the exact name, but there is no HTGR, high temperature gas reactor, gas cooled reactor. So, cooling is going to be done not in two phase mode, it is going to be only single phase and there they are contemplating of using plate fin heat exchangers. And in this the plate is not going to be straight, but the plate is going to be 
wavy. Why? What is the nature of the flow which would be typically in a plate finite exchanger? Imagine, you consider this, there are two plates, you put so many partitions, the each partition, the flow has to go through each partition. The flow is, someone said, laminar, F flow is laminar. The only way to augment the heat transfer there is to, we have studied this, to increase the swirl, so I have to generate swirl. That is why this partitioning wall is made as a wavy channel, because it is going to be wavy. So, I am going to create swirl or the velocity in the other direction, not turbulence. It is going to be laminar only. Flow is continuing to be laminar, but I am going to create swirl. That is, I am one I am going to make one laminar to talk with the another lamina by creating the velocity in the other direction. So, wavy type plate fin exchangers, lot of research is going on, okay? lot of research is going on. In fact, myself and Professor Atul Sharma have a student, we have learned from through Bark only. We have a student who is a scientist in BIRC who is doing the project on that. Okay. So, that is, the, there are plenty of applications of heat exchangers and, and it just came to me, I just told, fine. So, now coming back to overall heat transfer coefficient, I am not going to spend too much time on applications, that is it. So, now let us see the resistance, because of course, we have gone through, I am going to breeze through this, Professor has already told this in conduction itself. So, we have the convective resistance on the inner side, conductive resistance of the wall and the convective resistance on the outer side and I have as he had told whenever there is a u, there has to be an area. So, I have u i a i or u naught a naught. It is a good practice to keep this u a together. So, you do not have to worry about what is that you are handling. So, u is meaningless unless area is specified. We need to mention that because usually people ask what is the overall heat transfer coefficient. It is like asking Mangesh Choudhury, which Mangesh? I can have hundreds of Mangeshes, but uh, ma ma hundreds of Choudhury's, but which Choudhury? Mangesh, that is what makes Mangesh Choudhury. So, we need to qualify overall heat transfer coefficient, whether it is based on inlet area or outlet area. So, that is what is this and of course, for if I have fins, I am going to put the fin efficiencies both on the inner side and the outer side. Okay, these are the typical heat transfer coefficient. I do not think I need to spend time on this. All that you will realize through this is that for two phase flow heat exchangers, you will have higher heat transfer coefficient. Of course, here we need to spend time on fouling, because fouling is the student cannot realize for us, for all of us fouling is pretty common, because we have been biased because we have heard it so many times, so we know it very well. Fouling, we have to spend time, fouling increases resistance to, fouling is the sedimentation or because of some chemical reactions and scales are being formed. So, the conductive resistance which I was neglecting, which was only because of the thickness is going to get worse because of these scales. So, how do I get this fouling resistance? I have put here. RFI and RFO, how do I get this? How does do, how do, how are those standard values generated? But how do, how does one do an experiment to get that? No, not by using used tube. It is not possible to get the used tube. You do some accelerated chemical treatment experiments in our own labs. In fact, fouling is such an important thing in a power plant. I always quote this example, I learned this hard way, when we had a BHEL, we were myself, Professor Arun, RPV, Professor Vedula and Kananayar, we were involved earlier, although we got declutched later on, we were having discussions with BHEL Trichy. So, when we were designing that supercritical boiler design, when we were talks were there, a person from a chemical engineer had come for those discussions. His job, he said that his team's job is to control the pH of the fluids throughout the plant. Why? Because if it does not control the pH or maintain acidity or basicity properly, it is going to affect my scaling. So, that is the importance in real life, the scaling. Okay? So, scaling is taken care in real life in any, any power plant, any power plant it can be coal based, nuclear based, any power plant.
scaling is going to be a nightmare if I do not take care of the efficiencies properly. I remember in one of the steam power plants in, in one of the handbooks I had read the after 5 years in Russia after 5 years when they did the energy budgeting the pumping power went up by 20 to 25 percent after 5 years. Why? Because scaling, scaling has negative effect because I have to if I have to keep the same flow rate which otherwise would have had lesser pressure drop because of scaling my pressure drops have gone up. How many times I can open a meat exchanger and clean it? It is not possible and many a times I cannot reach everywhere. If it is a shell and tube it exchanger most of the times I cannot reach every nook and corner and do the descaling. It is not possible. So, even though I have done it may not be so efficient. Here we need to stop for students and emphasize that is why I have written chemical treatment plant pH and if scaling becomes a problem periodic cleaning it is not leaning periodic cleaning has to be done and downtime penalties are heavy. So, they do not like to shut down the plant. So, that is that is what we need to emphasize with the student and coming back to measurement they do scaled that is fast rated experiments. They, they have their own mechanisms of whatever scaling would have occurred in 10 years I will do it in shortest possible time by chemically increasing the concentrations or doing something these are what are called as accelerated experiments. Okay. Uh, of course, I can get the tube, but not always I can afford to get that information. So, that is how this RFI and RFO whatever we get in the standard tables are. Okay. So, these are the typical RFIs only I keep spending and tell them that you see this is meter squared Kelvin per meter this per watt this implies that if thermal conductivity is 2.9 it is 0.3 mm thick if it is made of limestone. I mean this number will not give me the feel, this number only will give me the feel. You see if this much is the fouling it can generate it is equivalent to 0.3 mm thickness of limestone, limestone's thermal conductivity is quite small 2.9 okay? fine. So, there is a problem I am not going to spend time this is the problem. I we just put this because we just want to show yeah through this problem what we try to show is that H i A i H a H naught A naught and initially I take a k here I have taken stainless steel tube where in which I have taken k of 15 this value has come with 15 although I have not shown this. If I change this with copper my k will go up to 400 and the conductive resistance will become one order less here it is 9 into 10 to the power of minus 3, here it is going to be 0.01 into 10 to the power of minus 3. That is the reason why I tell that in refrigeration all condensers, evaporators, every one are made of copper tubes. That is what I emphasize on this. Okay. Material selection is a biggest issue in heat exchanger design. So, why copper tube is so rigorously used is because of this. This number calculation will tell me. Otherwise, the resistance is thrown. Now, this resistance is pretty small compared to these two. Okay. Another thing, I think I am going to digress a little bit here. Uh, there is so much we can do here with this, this little calculation. I can calculate, I want to spend time one more minute or five more minutes on this because we have time. I can do measurement of heat transfer coefficient with this equation. Let us say I make conductive resistance 0 that is it is very less I take a thinnest possible plug. Now, I want to measure inner side heat transfer coefficient can I do in this heat exchanger tube in tube only let it be parallel counter it does not matter. I have three resistances H i based H o based and K based conductive resistance. Conductive resistance I have made it as thin as possible. So, it is gone. So, it is now between H i and H o. How can I make this? I want to measure the heat transfer coefficient on the inner side. Okay, that is one option. Basically, what he is saying is 
h naught I am going to increase it incessantly high. Steam, it is little difficult to get steam. I would say if I am to measure the heat transfer coefficient on the inner side with air as the flow medium, let us say, I can use outside. What is the other fluid you can easily think of which you can get it in the lab? Water. Keep your mass flow rates very high. So, then the Reynolds numbers are high. HOs will be of the order of thousands and HI is of the order of twenties and thirties at the most hundred. So, then what will happen? My U i A i is going to be equal to how do I get Q dot? Now, I, I guess you are with me now. I can get my H i because Q dot I know. So, this is another way of measuring heat transfer coefficient which you can perhaps try in your own heat exchanger. I do not know because both sides usually we use water water, but we can build one with water and air and people use this. Why I am quoting this example? Because if you want to go back home and do a research, you want to try twisted tape or you want to come up with your own configuration, new configuration put it on the inner side, put the air, make the air flow through it and out in the outer annulus you make the water flow or if you are handling laminar heat transfer coefficients, perhaps we can do this. Make the water on the inner side, make it laminar. On the outer side, even though it is water in all the heat exchangers which you have go back home and try this experiment. Inner side you keep the flow rates very less such that the flow rate is laminar. Outer side you keep the flow rate so high as much as your pump allows you. Do not think twice, check the mass flow rates, check H O A naught, make sure that it is very small. Even if it is not small, if you can quantify, can you quantify outer heat transfer coefficient if you know the mass flow rates? Yes or no? Yes, because I know the test motor correlation. I can apply Dittas Bolter correlation, I know that it is turbulent, make sure that it is turbulent and apply Dittas Bolter correlation, you get HO. Now, you should be getting in the same heat exchanger, check it out then. Now, the question is, now you will get into trouble. What is the Nusselt number you will get? You will get some representative Nusselt number. It will be neither 3.66 nor 4.36. Why? Because couple of issues it is going through developing region to fully developed because I am going to get one average number, one average number I am going to get. So, you will get somewhere between 3 point uh, sorry somewhere little higher than 3.66. It is going to be in heat exchanger typical boundary condition, nearest boundary condition what is that you would think of constant heat flux or constant wall temperature, nearer to constant wall temperature nearer to constant wall temperature, not truly constant, but it would not Nusselt numbers you cannot expect around 4.36, they have to be 3.66, but because you are traversing through developing region, the Nusselt numbers may go up, but please go back and try. Okay? Okay. Why I am saying this? Because this little equation again, yeah. Why is it constant wall temperature and not constant wall temperature? Why? Why? Imagine, let us imagine how, how can it be constant heat flux? How can it be constant heat flux? What is the what is considering about the heat transfer heat flux? Yes. Even in constant wall temperature case, same thing. It is we were worried about the heat transfer from fluid to plate only. Does not mean that see what is happening from here to here. If I take on the outer wall, if I said cold wall side, I am going to keep the flow rate very high. If very high mass flow rate is there means, what would be the temperature difference between m dot c in and m dot c out? Very small. So, that no, 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 my line of thought is not over, you have to be with me to come to cover you. So, if the mass flow rate is very high and the temperature gradient is very less, the temperature difference is what on the outer side? Very small. So, it is that is the reason why we are saying. In fact, when we do the experiment, we should take care that my mass flow rates are so high that my temperature differences are negligibly small, but that depends on my pump capacity. If it is going to be 0.2 HP only, if you can, 
replacing a pump I do not think in the present day is not a big headache. Change it to 0.5 HP, you will get higher mass flow rate. Okay. So, what I am trying to, why I am coming up with ideas is I am working around your constraints, whatever setups you have, what all experiments you can do with your own setups, that is what I am trying to do. Okay. Fine. So, then coming back, okay. now let us come back to traditional LMTDF approach and epsilon NTO approach. So, first let us take up LMTD approach and typical, ha, here before analyzing we make all assumptions, this is where we have to spend time. Steady flow, will it, will any heat exchanger work under steady flow? Typically, typically in a power plant, let us say how many days or how many hours or how many minutes a typical power plant will take to reach steady state? Couple of hours couple of hours it is going to take. So, point is and loads are also going to vary, it is not going to work, work only under one load. So, my heat exchanger normally is not going to work and is it will take enormous time to reach steady state. Why do I say this? Why do I say that heat exchanger is going to take enormous time to reach steady state? Why do I say this? I you have to tell me from transient conduction fundamental principles. Thermal inertia, rho V C P of my heat exchanger, heat exchangers are as big as this room or building for a power plant. So, rho V C P of this building, how much it would be? Building means building size heat exchanger that much fluid, it is going to be very, very large. So, this assumption of steady flow is in real life is not this we need to impress. However, for the sake of simplicity, we are taking it as steady flow. Another thing, kinetic energy and potential energy changes are neglected. Is it true? Is it true in power plant? One tube is sitting in third story building, another tube is sitting in first story at the ground floor. There is a potential head, but I am neglecting that. And it is going through all sorts of bends it is going through contractions, expansions because it has to go through all sorts of connections. So, there is going to be velocity change, there is going to be kinetic energy associated with it. In any derivation for that matter, assumptions is the place where we need to spend more time than the derivation itself. Okay. All the more important in case of heat exchangers. And next, thermophysical properties constant over the length, is it true? Perhaps it is true if I am handling air, but in water or liquids the properties are going to be going haywire. So, but nevertheless I am going to go ahead and make life simple and say that thermophysical properties are constant. But once you do this, after doing this you can ask them to change the analysis for varying property. If I take the varying properties what will happen? What is that will change? my H i and H o, I have to consider the variable properties. If you closely look, when you go back home in the notes, for variable properties in the correlations, there is a term called mu b by mu wall to the power of 0.33 in all the correlations. That essentially takes care of the variation of the properties. So, point is thermophysical properties are constant is assumption. Perhaps in a plate finite exchanger which is taking air as the fluid, if it is air as the fluid, it is not an out of the world assumption. Okay. No heat loss to the surroundings, you have done the experiment, so much our discussion on Q cold plus Q hot by 2 we took. Okay. So, that is not right, because point is there is going to be heat loss, there is bound to be heat loss, it has to talk to atmosphere, I am not outside the world, I am inside this world and heat transfer coefficient is constant over the length. Is this right? Perhaps not a bad assumption in heat exchangers I would say, it is not a such a serious assumption. Why? Because heat exchangers are quite lengthy, quite lengthy, initial heat transfer coefficients are going to be high, 
is this assumption going to be affecting on my heat load? Will it increase my heat load or decrease my heat load? If I have designed a heat exchanger, let us say my heat exchanger is short, where in which half of the length is fully partially developed, sorry developing and half is fully developed. But I will go ahead and make the design of the heat exchanger and design it for a given heat capacity or I will fix my heat exchanger size and design it and get one load. But actually in real life, that is the design load, but real life load will be more or less than this will be more. You, you are telling the same thing, but you said what if, what heat transfer coefficients have taken lower no than the actual. So, that means I have taken a conservative estimate of the h. So, my load has to go up that is what you meant in the mind, but most of the times that is what my teacher used to say most of the times you will tell opposite than what you thought. That is why he used to tell me whenever your teacher asks you a question stop a while, stop a while do not answer immediately. Even if a student asks you a question you should not respond to you, to him the way I respond very fast you should not I am very impulsive it should not be like that. You take a while ask him the same question to rephrase again you also rephrase it so that everyone else understand then you respond by that time you would have maintained that do not answer it impulsively mostly when we answer impulsively we are wrong we are exactly telling opposite of what we intended to tell. One, one assumption uh, pressure drop along the length of the heat exchanger what should it be how, how will it affect the design. Here in this design, I am not bothered about pumping power. I do not care which type, which size pump I am putting. I all that I say that these are the mass flow rate. How I get it, I do not care it. Later on, eventually, I will have to worry about that. But in this analysis, at this point of time, what professor is trying to say is that we are not worried about the pumping power. Okay. So, now I think we do the energy balances MCC. MCCPC, I do the energy balance and I call this as CCCH and I think I can skip this. This is the general thing which we draw, okay. I have taken this from Changal. I do the energy balance, I do not intend to do this derivation, I do not intend to do this derivation because you all I would have done n number of times. So, you do the energy balance basically and all that I need to tell is why is this plus and why is this minus, yes that is all, that is all. One is gaining, one is losing, so that is why these things only we have to uh, emphasize more with our students okay so that then they will get trained even when they start studying a textbook on their own what to look for and what not to look for okay so this is dtc dh and then we have an alternate method i equate that i get the temperature difference and i tell that as delta t lmtd this also we have defined already in convective heat transfer this is the parallel flow heat exchanger so, we get for parallel flow this one and counter flow this one. So, similar I usually give counter flow heat exchanger as a exercise. I solve it for parallel flow and give it for counter flow and we all know that counter flow LMTD is greater than that of parallel flow LMTD. Counter flow heat exchanger derivation, how many of you have done this? Okay. Please go others please go ahead and try it. Yeah. Okay. It is not. It will not come as simple as this. That is okay. why I have put the derivation here in case if you get stuck I have not skipped it, I have not skipped it, I have given the derivation. Okay. And please, <coughs> please go ahead and try. Yeah. And in fact uh, we upload this notes completely the way we are uploading for Moodle. In fact the same notes what we are teaching you is the one which we are using for our UG class. Yeah, it is there. Now what I am trying to say is you can share all this with your students. My, my one of my close friend Professor Srinivasan who is in faculty in IIT Madras used to tell, this is a fight of knowledge. The tools have to be common. In war one of the rule is what? Both the, both the guys should have the same weapon. So, why I keep telling, why I take this example because what I am reading to understand something has to be told to my student. He can also go back and read, maybe he will understand more than what I have understood. And he will come back and question me in that discussion, I will also learn something. That is the reason there is 
there is there should be that is why we are all worried about open source we should be sharing all the information that is one thing knowledge is one thing which will multiply by sharing okay so our motto in our iit is gnanam paramam dhyayam so we need to share only when we share we will learn more why i am taking so many examples because whatever most of the times when i was studying my teacher will not tell where is he taking it from i have to break my head after that course is over somewhere i will realize are yaar ye sab idhar hai had i read that after immediately after he had taught me it would have been so much easier for me to understand that is the reason why i am emphasizing so much don't be secretive about your information what you are assimilating to teach just give him he will make you understand much more than what you have understood believe me our students are much smarter than us i think you all will agree with us no no two ways about it they are all smarter than us they are all smarter than us with that assumption if i start if with that assumption if i start my life is that much easier for me that much easier for me okay anyway i got digressed fine so there are lots of problems you can solve that okay this is a standard exp i think we all give this what will happen <laughs> i think we will not harp on this you can apply a last petal rule and show that this so i think all of us this is a stock question so i am i don't want to spend time on this and condenser and boiler also professor has told yeah why is lmtd counter flow less than parallel flow yeah that's a good one. why is lmtd of counter flow higher than the pa lmtd of parallel, parallel flow, flow for, for the that same i just want to put the temperature profile so that that may aid in the thought process with if aid the thought process Yes. In the parallel flow detection, there is a temperature difference. It is decreases as length. Uh, Here, more or less, the temperature gradient is reasonably. That's that's that that reasoning. That was a very valid point. That's what we need to emphasize. That's what we need to emphasize. I will go to. I think now it's time to shift to our gears to epsilon NTU, and of course there are. only one point i would tell before going to epsilon into you I, i i saw in your uh, data handbook also kodan ram data handbook also uh, what i will do is that textbook i will purchase that kodan ram's handbook so that i can modulate accordingly the notes let us see because most of the things are there in that it's nice actually it's really nice so here we give some correction factors if it is if it is a multi pass and cross flow heat exchanger there are some charts you know these charts do you teach these charts yes so what are this f what is this f actually what is the physical significance of f what is its value going to vary between always in all of these charts it's anywhere between 0 to 1 what does it physically mean i will just tell physical meaning and tell where is this coming from how are these charts generated for that matter experimentally obtained Hmm? no they are not experimentally obtained analytical solutions okay in fact in heat exchanger course we teach them how to derive that okay don't give the impression that they are experimentally obtained any experimental data cannot be looking so nice all of us agree with that we had enough problems with little little experiments okay so these are all analytically derived when i say analytically derived there are any again inbuilt inbuilt assumptions these results are valid to the extent of the applicability of those assumptions so this is not bible or bhagavad gita or quran okay this is again valid to the assumptions okay to the extent of the assumptions okay so that that point we need to emphasize and another point i thought ha huh, f is between 0 to 1 what does that mean i am applying it to what you see u a f delta t lmtd for what is the reference i am taking counter flow why that is the best possible heat exchanger any other heat exchanger i build it is going to 
be not better than counter flow heat exchanger. That is why my F is going to be between 0 to 1. This two points we need to emphasize before we blindly apply this chart. Charge all of us can apply. Know this, do not know that, you get that, you put this, you are going to get the heat transfer coefficients. Yeah. Why, why he made one statement, right? Why are any other heat exchangers poorer in performance than the corresponding counter flow heat yeah, exchanger? That's a good, that's a good question. Why should it be? Why counter flow is, is my the hallmark? That is that's the ideal thing. That is the question. So, we should cross the exit of the hot fluid. That is why we have the, uh, that is our motor in the heat exchanger. Would like to get. No, no. What do you mean by cross? No, no, no. What did we say? Why did we explain parallel and counter flow? Counter flow is better than parallel. On what grounds we told? The temperature gradient as my fluid is traversing throughout the heat exchanger, the delta T's have to be reasonably constant. constant. That cannot be achieved in any other configuration. You go back and think. In shell and tube heat exchanger, cross flow heat exchanger, plate fin heat exchanger, you cannot achieve that. That is the reason it is delta T L M T D counter flow is taken as the reference. Okay. These two points we need to emphasize when we tell our students. Doing calculations, they will do it. Because once we to once we tell them how to apply these relations, they will do it. So I am not going to tell you how to apply this chart, P is known, R is known, I am not going to tell you all of that. Okay? So, with that I guess this is for cross flow, there are n number of problems at the end, these are all taken from Changal actually. So, I will stop and I have just put the procedure, I have just taken the recap, I am not going to do that again. Okay? So, you can take a recap before going and another thing I want to tell, before starting the second you have started today first class you have taken. When you go to the next class, what do you do with the first thing? Last class we need to discuss and there our power point helps. You cannot again summarize using the board. So, if you can afford to have power point, you flash the power point, spend 5 to 10 minutes first, because we are sure no student would have read and come. That can be taken for sure. Okay? Even if someone has read, it is good that he will understand it much better and maybe some doubt will crop up in his mind and he will ask, he will definitely ask and encourage questions. I have been always asking what are the questions, what are the questions. To the best of my, our possibility we have tried to ask, answer the questions. Not that we can answer all the questions, but we need to inculcate the habit of asking questions so that we are thinking. Okay? Okay. Let us say Excel and tube exchange. Shell and tube heat exchanger. Shell and tube heat exchanger. That's why. Shell and tube heat exchanger, how does it consist of? There are multiple tubes. Okay. And through the shell it is coming and getting out through the shell. And there are baffles. Okay. And it is not going to go through. H naught I cannot compute. Okay. I have to go through serpentine passages. So, there is lot of empiricity in that and definitely because it is not the heat exchange is not as proper as it would have occurred in counter flow heat exchange. Tube in tube. Tube, sorry, tube in tube counter flow heat exchange. No, no, we cannot call any of other heat exchangers as parallel and counter flow. How many of you are with me when I say shell and tube exchange? All of you can imagine shell and tube. So, so there is in cross flow heat in shell and tube exchanger. Is there any counter flow all the time? No. Sometimes my fluid is going up. Yes. So that is yeah, correct. Correct. So that is why it is somewhere between. Very rightly told. Parallel, cross, counter. So, but I have taken one case parallel, one case counter. So, any other case has to be in between these two. That is how I think always. Okay.